Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very empowering show coming right up with special guest, Amy Newmark. And she's here today to share with us the new Chicken Soup for the Soul book, Making Me Time, 101 Stories About Self-Care and Balance. Now, do you ever say that I'll take care of myself after I finish this massive to-do list that's pretty much probably never ending? Amy's here to share with us some stories from the book convincing you that you need to put yourself at the top of the list. Self-care and life balance are the things that we neglect the most. Now, many of you know Amy. She's been on the show before. She is the best-selling author, editor-in-chief, and publisher of the Chicken Soup for the Soul book series. Since 2008, she has published 133 new books, most of them national bestsellers in the U.S. and Canada, more than doubling the number of Chicken Soup for the Soul titles in print today. Amy is also the author of Simply Happy, a crash course in the Chicken Soup for the Soul advice and wisdom that is filled with easy-to-implement practical tips for having a better life. So let's welcome to the show, Amy Newmark. Well, thanks for having me on. I'm really excited about this topic. You know, I just read a survey that was done among busy women, and they were asked what was the thing they wanted most for Valentine's Day, which of course we just had. And they, 52% of them, I think, said they wanted me time. I mean, that was the thing they wanted the most was just time for themselves. Oh my gosh. Isn't that the truth, right? (laughs) Especially now it's like women are wearing so many hats, you know, all of a sudden, you know, we're now at home, we're the caretakers, we're the school teachers. I mean, you know, God bless the school teachers, you know, but we're doing all these things. So carving out that me time is really tough. Yeah. Cause even if you're an empty nester, now your husband wants to know at noon what you're making for dinner right? <laughs> like I've become such a chef, <laughs> right? Which I, I enjoy, but not every single night, you know, and I had to fend off his questions about what do you want for lunch? I said, I will never, ever provide lunch. That is never happening, you know? Oh my gosh, that is too funny. But I know there are a lot of people out there that can really relate to that. So when you decided that this is a book that needed to be written now, What were some of the things that made you decide, okay, we need to really focus on me time? I guess I thought about my own life, and it sure is a topic of great interest during the pandemic. I mean, all the women are talking about me time and how they just don't have any. But even in normal life, I mean, I remember years ago on Mother's Day asking my husband for this for Mother's Day. I said, I want one hour uninterrupted, where you don't let the kids come near me and I get to read a book. And we had this one deck off our house that nobody ever used and the kids basically didn't know it existed. And I went and hid there for one hour. And that was one of my favorite Mother's Day gifts ever, <laughs> right? Just one hour to read uninterrupted. Oh my gosh. And you know what? It's simple things like that that can make such a huge impact in kind of allowing us to kind of reset. You know, when you were getting all the stories together for this book, was there one that kind of stood out to you like, hey, you know, this one's just right in line with the whole me time thing? Yeah. And there was one, and I just thought it was such a good visual. It was actually from um, Christine Byron, who is um, the mother of our associate um, publisher, Diet Corona. And Um, Her mom wrote that she used to sell for Tupperware and she was so busy and she could never get anything like she never had any time for herself. She never really even had time for her family because it was just one Tupperware, you know, meeting after another. And then her manager said to her, well, you haven't scheduled any lily pads. And Christine said, what are lily pads? And she said, they are places you can hop onto on your calendar and just breathe. I love the visual of that. And so she started building in basically fake meetings onto her calendar so that nobody could take that slot and schedule her for something. And those were her lily pads. And imagine a busy little frog and then the frog hops onto that lily pad and sits there and just breathes and sits in the sun 
and relaxes for an hour. And I thought that is such a great way of looking at our daily calendars. We've got to give ourselves those lily pads. And so for me, that's usually an hour of exercise or an hour of reading. But when you read the 101 stories in our Making Me Time book, you find that people have so many different ways that they want to spend their me time because, you know, there's different things that work for each person. So what I love about this is that you'll see what worked for all these other people, and then it will give you an idea for what will work for you. Yeah, you can start incorporating some of them in your lives. It's one of the things I really love about Chicken Soup for the Soul, you know, book series is because with each story, there's something there for everybody. And you can turn any day to any of the pages and you get great inspiration on, you know, when we were talking about me time and how to develop me time, you know, in, in the other books you have, some of them are funny, some of them are supportive. They just are so amazing. I love the entire series. Well, what I like is I don't really like somebody telling me what to do. And so let's say, you know, hey, I need me time in my life. I am so frazzled. I will be more productive if I take one hour off my calendar each day and use it for myself to do something I want to do. But if you just go and read some nonfiction book that gives you advice, Um, they might just tell you what to do. And so then you might read a book about meditation where this person says, meditation is the key to everything. You've got to meditate for half an hour every day. Well, I know I tried that and I hated it. And I was starting to bargain like, well, could I walk outdoors while I meditate? Could I ride my bike while I meditate? Like They were like, no, you can't do anything. You just have to sit and meditate. And I said, well, that doesn't work for me at all. I have to be doing something. And so, you know, if you, what I like about our books is that we're not telling you what to do. We're just saying, hey, here's what worked for 101 other people. Make your own plans, but these will, these will give you inspiration. And I think what our book does is it shows you the before and after of each person, like how frazzled they were, how they were unhappy before, and then they figure out how to build some meaningful time into each day or each week for themselves. And then they feel so much better. So you see the before, you see the after. How they got there is merely what worked for them and what works for you might be entirely different. So that's why I like all of our books. I personally have learned so much from them and have had my life changed so much as a result of kind of digesting all of these great stories. Oh my God, they're they're amazing. And I know that you get so many submissions. Was it really hard to choose the stories for this book? Yeah, it's always hard because you feel a little bit like a, you know, college admittance counselor, or you know, you feel like you're turning away so many good ones because we always have more than we need. And so we'll try to find a place in them for them in other future books. Um But, you know, if five people write in about the same way that they found their me time, we won't be able to use necessarily all five of them. But it's always a great experience because I'm lucky I get to read more than just the stories that we publish. But then I find myself going back later and rereading the books and kind of re-upping that lesson that I learned. Like, I bet I'll go back and read the Making Me Time book in another year and it will help me recommit to my me time. And in my case, my me time is that I have to have time to read every day, to read a book that I did not edit. So, you know, for somebody else, it could be meditation. For someone else, it could be baking bread. It could be taking a walk. You know, one thing I discovered, and you might be hearing this with all the people you are interviewing, is so many people found their me time during the pandemic involved getting outside in nature. That was a really, really big theme in the book. I can understand that too. I feel like I get recharged when I'm in nature, you know, and what a great resource for people to go, gosh, you know, maybe I need to go outside for a walk and maybe nature's just right around my neighborhood. I mean, at least they feel like they have an outlet. Yeah, because, you know, it's been so tough the last 12 months or so. And between the pandemic and then people having economic problems as a result, and then worrying about what's going on in Washington and everything else, 
people have been overly stressed. Like a lot of people talk about how they've just been having vivid, scary dreams constantly since the pandemic started. But when you walk outside and you see these trees that, you know, were there before you were born and will be there after you go, and you see the birds who don't care what's going on, you know, and you see all the animals you know, running about doing their thing and the breeze comes and you get into that flow of nature, it really gives you perspective and it makes you realize that, you know, this too will pass and you're not that important in the grand scheme of things. Those gigantic, majestic trees that you're walking by, they don't care who you are. You know, so I feel like getting out in nature has become very healing for people. And we really saw a lot of extra emphasis on getting out in nature in this book. And I'm hoping that this is something we keep doing going forward, even when the pandemic is over, that we all remember how much we loved getting outside. I completely agree with you. I mean, there's this wealth of ways to recharge, have our me time, and really get to this place where we can finally relax. And it has me thinking, in your book, You have all these great subjects that cover things like self-care isn't selfish and declutter detox. As you are going through all the stories that you received for the book, was there one story that stood out as something that would have a great impact in people's lives? Yeah. So I think that one of the key themes I picked up was that necessity of building that me time into your calendar, either blocking out time each day, or it doesn't have to be each day. It could be once a week. For example, we had one woman where her me time is just Saturdays. And everybody knows that Saturday mornings extending till two in the afternoon, those hours are sacred. That is when she goes and she goes to her horse. And that is her time. And she has to be with her horse that one time per week. And if they're having a family event and it involves lunch, everybody knows lunch is not going to start until the middle of the afternoon. And so all week she knows she has that coming for her. And we had another woman who's a teacher and she, and she finds school very stressful because if she's not teaching, she's in meetings or she's preparing for a class or a kid needs, needs extra help. And for her, the me time that she just thinks about all week is that on Saturday, she's going to her dance class. And it's not like she's a great ballerina, but she loves ballet and she just goes and she does her best. But that time that she goes to ballet class, that's her time to do what she's passionate about. And so people really look forward to that me time and it's like a little mini vacation. And so some of them just have it regularly scheduled on their calendar. Um, Some people, their method is to put themselves on their to-do list. So we all have a to-do list right? And a lot of us have one every day, every week. But how often do we write on our to-do list, like one hour of reading, one hour of walking, one hour to do whatever I feel like doing on Wednesday. And so that's another method that we saw a lot of people realizing that they were always saying, I will do my me time after I finish my to-do list. So the idea is kind of pay yourself first, put yourself on your to-do list. And then I also loved some of the people who got really, really creative. So we have this nun who writes for us once in a while, Sister Josephine Palmieri, and she's a high school teacher, and she loves taking a walk after school each day, but kids also want to come to her for extra help or to talk about their personal problems. So she kept missing her late afternoon walk, which was just awful because she started resenting the kids showing up for help, even though really she wanted to welcome them. And then she realized, oh my gosh, they can just go on the walk with me. So then she started saying, come on the walk with me. And she would take her afternoon walk each day with a different kid and help that kid with their problems. And she was getting her walk and she was getting the kids some exercise too. And so it was a good reminder that you can multitask and you can say, if if a walk is really important to you, you can say, well, that's when I'm going to make the phone calls that I need to make also, or that's when I'm going to have the business meeting and have this person come and do the walk with me. So I liked that also, a lot of good creative strategies. 
that's so important, you know, to keep that creativity going so we can find new ways of carving out that me time and really being able to honor ourselves. One of the many things I appreciate about this book is it really dives into creativity so we can discover our own ways of creating that me time in our own lives. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Some people discovered that they were already doing their me time, which was pretty funny. Like um, one woman kept saying, okay, I know I have to go and figure out what my me time is. I know I need to engage in self-care. So it was like it was on her to-do list, but she kept procrastinating and sitting outside and watching the birds and watching the bees pollinate the flowers. And like, she just kept sitting on her front porch with her dog and watching the birds and being guilty, thinking, well, I haven't really put me time on my schedule yet. And then she finally realized, oh yeah, that is my me time. You know, if you think about what you naturally do when you say procrastinate, well, that might be your me time. So you might as well just accept it and embrace it and you won't feel guilty anymore. You'll actually feel like, all right, I did something. I got my me time scheduled. Another woman, she knew she needed me time. She was so frazzled. She was so busy all the time. And she loved going to her libraries once a year book sale, you know, she would always buy a hundred used books because, you know, they'll sell them for you know a dollar or two and you get a hardcover, you know, recent bestseller to take home. And so one year they went and the ladies who ran it said, well, this is going to be the last year of the sale because most of us are older and we can't do it anymore. And nobody has stepped up to volunteer. So that's it. And so her husband who was standing with her said that she would do it. And she looked at him like, I can't do it. I don't even have time for me time. How can I go and do this? He said, just do it. So she went. And the very first day that she went, she was in the library basement. She was looking at all these books that she loved. She was touching the books. She realized, oh my gosh, this is my me time. Spending a couple of two hour blocks a week working in the library basement and organizing books, which I love so much. This is the me time that I thought that I wasn't going to have because I was doing this volunteer work. So sometimes it's staring us right in the face and we just don't realize it. Isn't that how life is? You know, sometimes we need a little help just to see what's right before us. So your story in the book really touched me. You know, you talk about how we treat ourselves in such this beautiful and unique way. And you talked about having your landscaper add more flowers to your yard since you're going to be home more and not that you were expecting company. Yeah, so that's one of the things. There's a couple of really important things I've learned from working at Chicken Soup for the Soul. And we actually have stories about both of these things in this book. So the first one is that you really should treat yourself as well as you would treat a guest, right? I mean, you have like the the nice towels in the powder room and the nice soap that maybe you don't have in the other bathrooms in the house. Or you, you know, bring out the nicer napkins when a guest comes, or you pour the nicer water, or whatever it is. Well, why aren't you treating yourself that way as well? And so, at the beginning of the pandemic last spring, I was talking to our landscaper, and I did say to him, "I want you to plant more flowers than we've ever had before. I want everything to look really, really great." And he said. And most of his customers were asking for less because they weren't having company. And I said, well, we're going to be here. So I want it to look great for us. And so I did all these things to the house. I spent a lot of money. I got the roof power washed because it had like mildew all over it. I got all of our, you know, walkways and the pool deck and everything power washed, which I hadn't done in many, many years. I just refurbished everything. I had the electricians come and fix all the outdoor light bulbs, whatever projects I had been putting off for 10 years, I had somebody come and do these projects. And I like, I got our bikes redone. So I had, I found a guy who would do like curbside service. So he came and he fixed our bikes, which we hadn't ridden in about 20 years, but I did all of this stuff. And then we actually went ahead and had a really great time in the summer, you know, sitting in the hot tub, looking at everything being clean. Um, We discovered that we had these gorgeous flowering trees in our backyard that we never knew we had, even though um, I've lived in this house, you know, I don't know, 
25 years or something like that. And I didn't realize we had these humongous tulip poplar trees in our backyard with these gorgeous yellow flowers on them. So we had such a good time kind of treating our house as if it were like an inn, you know, where you would go and do all these fun, relaxing things and be treated as a valued guest. And I just set it up for us to have that same experience here. And my husband started ordering really nice wines, um, which was funny because I had to keep running downstairs and showing my face to the UPS guy through the window so that he would know there was, you know, a 21 year old in the house. Uh, because they <laughs> they can't drop off wine without that. So we had a really good time treating ourselves as well as we would treat a guest. Um, the other theme in the book that is something that I didn't understand until I was 50 years old and started working at Chicken Soup for the Soul. The other theme was about not only decluttering your life of like stuff, you know, possessions that everybody I think was cleaning out extra possessions during the pandemic, but also cleaning out basically the people in your life, because sometimes you have to sit back and basically look at your life as a garden and do some pruning and pull those weeds. And so we have stories in Chicken Soup for the Soul Making Me Time about people who realized that their friends weren't really friends anymore. They were more like obligations or they were people who weren't even nice to them. And so they said, wow, I actually get to choose who my friends are. Friends are supposed to add value to my life. And so as part of their making me time, they got those people off their calendar so that they could open up time in their calendar for people who really add value to their lives. And what a huge thing that is, because that's so true. I mean, they talk about, you know, how our centers of influence are really the people that we spend time with. And so if we take, you know, kind of um, reference of everyone that we're doing that with, are they really somebody we should be spending time with? Yeah. And I honestly didn't understand that. Like if you've ever said, oh, I have this friend and I have to go see her or she's going to tell me all her problems and oh, she just complains all the time, whatever it is, well, then actually you should probably reduce the amount of time that you spend with that person because you're not really getting value from that. And you have to be a little selfish with your time and you really will be a better mother, daughter, friend, you know, wife, whatever to the people who really do matter to you. If you've been a little more aggressive about doing those carve outs and and preserving the valuable time that you have for the people who you love without the stress of bringing in the people who are making you a little bit unhappy. So that was a really valuable lesson for me. And it's funny when I wrote my memoir in 2016, which is called Simply Happy, I had that tip in there, that lesson about how you can actually choose your friends and you're allowed to change them as your life goes on. And people said to me that that was the most important thing they learned in that entire book. So I think it's a pretty common problem that we forget that friends are optional. They're not mandatory. Relatives are mandatory, but not friends. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, and what's interesting, you really get to choose who you have in your space, you know, regardless, family, friends, whoever, you get to choose who you have in your space. And you know, sometimes it's a, a good thing. Sometimes it's not. One of the chapters you have, chapter three, I really appreciate because it talks about accepting help. And how often do people go through life feeling like we have to do it all and be it all. And then maybe they just need a little help sometimes and they don't really, you know, they're not sure how even to ask for help. I know women sometimes, first of all, women just assume that other people, especially husbands or boyfriends or sons, will be able to tell when the woman is struggling, bringing in the groceries from the garage or whatever it is. Men won't just automatically know that you need help when you are struggling carrying in the heavy things. You have to actually say, could you please help me bring in the groceries? And then the man will spring to attention and happily help out. 
And mothers just assume in general that kids should see that they're struggling, but kids are kids and they don't see that. And so we have this whole chapter about women learning to accept help, for example, when they're ill and they really need help and they shouldn't just be the martyr, but also women learning to ask for help. And so we have these moms saying that they never asked for help and they were just suffering and then they became resentful of their family members And then they learned that they could just have a family meeting and say, you know what, I really need the help. I mean, I remember one person said that she saw her, I think it was her sister's family, and the kids were proudly saying what they were in charge of. Like one kid said, I'm in charge of everything related to food. And so he helped bring in the groceries. He helped his mom cook the dinner. He helped clean up. Another person was in charge of everything related maybe to outdoor work but the kids took on their portion of the chores. They just needed to be told. And it also made them feel like they were adding value. And that was a good thing. So yeah, you're right. Chapter three is really important because we do not ask for help enough or someone offers help and we say, oh no, that's okay. When we really should have said, yes, please. My goodness. Yes. A big thank you. You know, you cover so many points here that I felt were really important. When we look at chapter eight, the topic is about you deserve it. And a lot of times, just like needing help, people feel that maybe they don't deserve time to themselves. I know some people just don't do it. Like they'll never take a vacation. And we had this one woman, I thought this was very clever. Um, Her coworkers kept telling her to go on vacation, but she actually couldn't afford to go on vacation. So There was no way she was going anywhere, but they were bugging her so much to go on vacation that she finally just told them that she was. And so she told them she was going away one weekend, taking a little mini vacation. But what she did actually was on the way home from work, she stopped at a convenience store and she bought a lot of soda and snacks and things she wouldn't ordinarily treat herself to. And then she spent the whole weekend reading novels and drinking soda and eating the snacks that she had bought for herself. And when she went back to work on Monday after her imaginary vacation, her coworkers said, wow, you must have had a great vacation. You look so rested. And that's when she realized that she was, and she had been really stressed before that weekend, and now she wasn't even stressed. And she realized, I did deserve to take a vacation, but even though I didn't have any money, I made myself a vacation in my own way, which I thought was terrific. Um, But yeah, you really have to believe that you deserve to take the time for yourself. You deserve to spend a little bit of money on doing that thing that you want to do. You deserve to treat yourself as well as a guest. One woman, Jenny Ivey, talked about how she always decorated for Halloween. And this past October for Halloween, She thought, oh, no, nobody's going to come to the house for trick-or-treating. I'm not going to have any guests. I don't even have family members coming. And then she decided to put out all her Halloween decorations anyway. And she did it just for herself. And she was thrilled to have all her decorations out. Well, you know, and that's the important thing. If anyone shows up or not, you know, you do it because it brings you joy. Yeah, like my husband and I still have our Christmas decorations up, except for the tree. Everything else is still up <laughs> because we've enjoyed <laughs> seeing them so much. I don't know. I guess we'll take them down when, you know, the tulips start to come up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's an unusual year, so people can do whatever they want, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, you know what? And nobody can see it. Nobody sees it anyway, except the UPS guy. You know, the UPS guy knows everybody's secrets, but <laughs> no one else knows that we still have all our Christmas decorations up. Well, you know, the things that make us happy, it's it's really interesting. You know, what we end up doing to just bring joy into our homes is so unique for everyone. And that's why I found Making Me Time was such a great book. I just absolutely love it. You know, gosh, Amy, we could talk all day. We we have no problem doing that. Where can our listeners learn more about this book and all the other great Chicken Soup for the Soul books? Well, our website, chickensoup.com, is filled with information. And if you go there, you can click on 
the Making Me Time book. It will be on the home page, and then you can look at the front cover. You can look at the back cover, which has a lot of description, and also you could sign up for the Chicken Soup daily email newsletter, and you'll get stories from this book and our other books. So that gives you some free samples. Whenever our new books come out, and that way you can decide which ones you want to buy for yourself or as a gift for someone else. You know, they're perfect gifts, and I just absolutely love this book. Amy, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Well, thank you so much. I feel like I had a little half hour of me time myself because this was a nice break from work, so thanks. Well, thank you, Amy. As always, it's been such a pleasure to spend this time with you and to talk about the new Chicken Soup for the Soul book, Making Me Time, 101 Stories About Self-Care and Balance. To learn more about this book and all the other Chicken Soup for the Soul books, visit chickensoup.com for more information. Making Me Time's available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And if you don't see it on the shelf, ask for them to order it. And of course, it's available on Kindle. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information. <laughs>